Good afternoon everyone. Welcome back to the nature patch. I'm inside at the moment just actually warming my fingers up because it is really really cold outside. Today I thought I would do a, another garden with me. Just wanted to do a nice relaxing afternoon in the garden sharing what I'm getting up to. The thing is though it is super windy outside. There are so many dogs barking around the cats or also yelling at me. There's a lot going on around. So I'm going to do a voiceover for this video and share what I'm getting up to in the garden. I actually took uh, the Wednesday video off this week just because I wasn't feeling 100%. I feel like everyone has something going on right now with their health. The start of winter has certainly got to me. <laughs> But as you'll know, going out into the garden always does make me feel better. So I have a few jobs that I'm going to do today. And I also will include at the start of this video, just a little walk through the garden where I'll talk through what's happening, what's going on in the garden right now, um, because today I'm actually going to be pulling out quite a few things. So it is going to look quite different. So I wanted to document what it's looking like at the start of June as well. I really love this window because I can see it right out to the garden there. Uh, and this window also gets nice sun all day. So I like to come down here and do some work, but I do need to get up and try and get warm and head back outside and do some garden work. So I'll take you along and share what I'm doing and what the garden is looking like at the moment. So it's the start of winter here and the garden is actually still looking really, really pretty this time of year. We've still got lots of flowers around and lots of things growing. This is an update on the broad beans that I planted. I really do need to kind of just pinch them so they start growing a little bit more bushy rather than straight up. You can see that they're just growing really straight here and this is a problem if we get really high winds. This is a snapdragon here and I did the same thing. I snipped off the top to um, encourage it to bush out and you can see how it's growing out from the sides here. This is going to give me more flowers of this plant and I want to do that for the broad beans as well. This is all of the Chinese broccoli, the little white flowers. They are going absolutely crazy and flopping over because they just don't have any more support. They just got too heavy and we had really heavy winds. So this is one of the jobs that I'm going to be tackling today because all of those plants below are just being shaded by the plants that are now laying on the ground. They are so, so beautiful. And I really like growing these for the flowers because the pollinators you can see a little honeybee there. They absolutely love them. It's a great way to encourage more pollinators into your garden. If you let some of your brassica plants flower, um, the, the bees just seem to absolutely go crazy for them. So I love having them in my garden. And I think they kind of create like a little cottage vibe as to these stock. These are just really miniature dwarf stock, but they give off so much scent. Stock is very strong in scent, so if you're not really a floral person, you might not like the smell. I absolutely adore it and get whiffs of it from the garden as I'm walking around. I really, really love it and I think it just looks so pretty in a cottage garden. Although things are growing fairly slowly, things are still happening in the garden. So like my lavender here has started flowering. I bought this for a dollar from Bunnings and chopped it back a lot. And you can see now that it is blooming and it's looking really, really happy. As well as my uh, snowflakes, I think these bulbs are that are popping up. These are looking really happy and I am glad that they all came up because I have had troubles with the bandicoot digging these up and having to replant them. And these are going to look really pretty around this uh, sea mist melaleuca plant. Behind that, I have some kohlrabi and sea this is what happened after all of that rain that we had a lot of the kohlrabi didn't really bulb up and they just split this happens to a lot of vegetables when you get really uh, heavy rains or different patterns of rainfall that can just stress the plants out but this is the other kohlrabi that was doing okay so i definitely will get a few from the garden 
Um, and I also, I have to show you this because my Tatsoi is just the most beautiful thing. It is so, so gorgeous massive this is what it looks like compared to my hand and I just like growing these because they look beautiful they also taste delicious in so many different dishes like soups and curries and Asian dishes as well as the bok choy behind it and this here is my ranunculus tunnel I have to have some kind of wire over it because of the bandicoot likes to dig them up and I'm hoping this tunnel will be a sea of rainbow in spring Alongside some flowers, I have some broccoli planted throughout the garden, which is looking really good, as well as the mizuna, this bright purple, leafy, beautiful, gorgeous plant. So that's a little quick overview of the garden, and now let's get back to the garden jobs. Right, first job this afternoon is to tidy up that Chinese broccoli behind me. You would have seen in the little overview of the garden that it is just getting too big and flopping over and falling onto a lot of the other plants. But my problem is, not that it's really a problem, but it's a problem for me personally, um, that the pollinators are loving this plant. There's honeybees, there's native bees that absolutely go crazy for the flowers on Chinese broccoli. And that's predominantly why I grow it. I don't really grow it for food or to eat the leaves or anything like that, but you definitely can. And that is what it's actually grown for. But I like growing it for the leaves because it just looks so, so pretty and the pollinators love it. And because they love it and it's a food source right now, what I'm going to do is not actually cut it all back. I'm going to leave a little bit there and this ensures that when the bees come back, they will have food for the next few days. And I'll gradually decrease the amount of it there, replacing it with something else. There is a lot of other things that are starting to flower in the garden, so they will definitely still have food. But it is something just to keep in mind when you're removing plants, changing up the garden a little bit, just to know that changing one thing, like tearing out a whole um, group of plants, is really going to disrupt the ecosystem that you have created, including habitat and food for all of the pollinators and bugs. So changing gardens slowly over time is a really great way to switch things up, and that means that you'll have the least amount of impact on the garden uh, as you possibly want. I also picked up some new pruners from Bunnings the other day because mine were just really not good. I really didn't uh, take care of them that well. I'm definitely not going to do that with these. I do really want Felcos and I am saving up for them but I probably do need just a few pairs of pruners for the amount that I actually use them and um, I'm kind of traveling with them and things like that. So I'm just trying these ones here. These are the Fiskars brand uh, and they're nice and light and small and compact so they'll be really good um, just for like traveling around when I do regen work. So I'm going to open these up and see how they are today. They're nice and sharp and they have a spring that uh, you can replace if you need. So I'm going to give these a go and just prune and take out a few of those plants. I'm just going to snip them at the base and that means that all of the roots that are in the ground are just going to decay over time. That's going to add organic matter back into the soil and is kind of one of those like no dig principles that I like to follow in the garden. I'm sorry bees. I'm sorry to take your food away. Oh but they're just so cute. They're so pretty might actually prune some of these too and use them in a little posy because they're just so pretty and I really want to enjoy them. I just wish it didn't flop over because we get really high winds and, and I probably should have staked them but I didn't and that's okay. I'm just gonna take these, I'm just gonna take these two out today and I'll leave the rest for another few days and then do the rest later.
feel very pretty. But I do need some more flowers to go with these, so let's go find some. So thankfully I still have a lot of zinnias in the garden. They are very much dwindling, but I still do have a few. But I'm gonna pick some of these and add them to the little collection that I have going. I'm doing some experiments in the garden of things that um, last really long in vases and I have this bottle brush here behind me. I want to see how it goes in water so I'm just going to cut some of this and see what it ends up looking like. I'm definitely hardcore procrastinating actually doing the garden jobs I said I was going to do instead just making like a flower bouquet arrangement but I'm not too sure if I have anything else in the garden at the moment that I want to pick except daffodils but I think I kind of want to enjoy those so I'm just going to see what this looks like. I'm just going to pull it together. We'll see what these random things look like. I'm sorry grasshopper. I'm sorry to disturb your home. Okay, we're all good. So I thought for this section I would do a little bit of a voiceover again just to talk about what I'm doing here and give a few little tips on flower arranging. I am by no means a florist and have taught myself from watching copious amounts of YouTube videos um, and just trial and error really. Um, but I have found a few things that really help when arranging flowers. The first that you can see that I'm doing here is removing all of the flowers from the base of the stems that are going to be in contact with the water. Having leaves touch water is going to make the water a lot more murky really quickly. So you want to remove as many leaves as you can. I'm starting this arrangement with a focal flower, which is the stock. I wish I had more, but I only just have that little one. Um, and starting with a centerpiece is really useful because you can build around it. So I'm building around this with the, um, the Chinese broccoli flowers and then kind of a halo of zinnias around. And starting from the middle and working out is a really good way to just create a feature or a focal point for the bouquet. Um, and for me, that was the stock flower as well as some of the foliage that I tried to add in. I should have added this in first, so I'm just sticking it in now. Adding foliage is something that I never really used to do, but it makes such a big difference. Adding things that move and are a little bit more wispy in bouquets really adds a lot of um, just different dimension and overall height which makes the bouquet look bigger and just way more eye-catching so definitely use a little bit more filler um, or foliage if you are making different arrangements for the first time and it makes the world of difference and then you just want to cut the stems to the length that you'd like and this is again trial and error see what works well um, and see I'm putting it back in here and I'm noticing that it's not falling how I want it to so I'm just cutting the stems a little bit more and then just replacing the water every day with fresh water is going to make your flowers last a lot longer uh, than if you just leave the water in there 
making sure everything's nice and clean and fresh the flowers and the foliage are really going to um, bounce back a lot better and also just removing some of the flowers that are starting to look a little bit droopy or deadheading them from your bouquet is also just going to improve the longevity of the flowers that you have in your vase so you can enjoy it for a little bit longer. I think it looks quite pretty. I'll see how these bottle brush leaves hold up in the water. But this is definitely gonna make me happy seeing all of these gorgeous flowers inside. The next job that I really need to do is prune this hydrangea. You can prune hydrangeas pretty much any time after they stop flowering or the flowers start to die back. So winter time is a really great time to be pruning your hydrangeas. And it's really up to you how much you want to cut it down by. Because this plant is quite established and I want it to stay nice and big and established, I'm not gonna be pruning it like right down to the ground. I'm just gonna cut it back and see what it's looking like um, in the middle of the plant, see how healthy it is. But this is a very blue hydrangea and you can, I think you increase the acidity, I think, and that can turn the flowers pink. I'll correct myself on the screen if I am wrong. I've never like, grown hydrangeas before i don't know too much about them but this is quite a big plant i'm just going to dump all of the flowers and everything in a pile i just need to get this job done because i am losing light today and for this job i'm going to be using the same brand that i had the um what are they called uh pruners i think that's what they're called uh, i'm just going to be using these loppers to help with this plant because it's quite big this is also by Fiskers and this is totally not sponsored. They just looked like good ones from Bunnings. So I picked them up because I needed them. But to be honest, I wouldn't mind being sponsored by them because they're pretty good so far. I don't really know what I'm doing. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna try and, you know, cut this thing down a bit, you know? Okay, so I can pretty clearly see where there's like good healthy growth coming out of these ones here with these new buds on them versus some of the old growth, like these ones here, which don't have any on them. They just have the old flowers on them. And these are the ones that I'm gonna to prioritize to get rid of from this plant. So it has predominantly new and healthy growth. probably tell pruning is not my favorite activity I got a little bit over it and actually ended up going inside making dinner having a cup of tea uh, and just chilling on my Friday night the next morning this is what the hydrangea ended up looking like I kind of just cleared all of the sticks and twigs and the dead flowers and you can really see that this is an older plant it has a lot of old growth on it that I'm probably just going to need to go in and remove it the ones that I'm pointing to um, because it's just too old and those aren't going to produce any nice blooms you can see these ones here that are looking a lot more healthy and young and green at the top. When you cut it, you can see it's really healthy. 
those are going to be the ones that are going to bloom again and give me good growth rather than this one here which you can see it is dead and very much on its way out so those are the ones that you really want to prioritize if you are pruning your hydrangeas and keep some of the other ones if you want to make sure that your plant is growing bigger and bigger each year it was definitely a haircut um, but i really needed to do this so i'm hoping that it comes back okay but if you do have any tips on growing hydrangeas or caring for them definitely leave them in the comments section um, i think that would be really helpful for both me and maybe for everyone else too this was some of the uh, branches that I had left over and I ended up chopping up all those to use on top of what I'm going to show you now. Um, I was adding to the native garden down here by just killing the grass and creating more kind of no dig beds. The flowers or the dead flowers make a really, really great mulch. So I was taking them all down there. They're really crunchy and they are really great at holding moisture when they're all kind of grouped together as, you know, a mulch. So I'm doing my usual thing that I do to kill the grass around here. I'm prioritizing around the fence and around the plants that I already have by just um, sheet mulching with cardboard and then adding the organic matter on top of that. And this is over time going to break down. I'm just trying to break it up a little bit more. And as it rains, this will all compact down a lot more. And whenever I have clippings like these uh, broccoli stalks or ferns or palms or whatever I have in the garden, I'm just going to add it to this area and wet it with water. The water is just going to weigh it down a little bit more because we do have really high winds here. I don't want the cardboard to fly up. So I'm just making sure it's nice and heavy um, so that everything is weighed down. And eventually this will break down and be just a full garden bed in this area uh, up to where all of those stakes are, where we have our, all of our beautiful native plants. Then uh, next to that, down below a little bit more, I have our little fire pit. We had a pretty big fire the other night just to clear up a lot of things and also to create pot ash which is all of this white stuff here. There's two kind of byproducts from a fire. You usually get a lot of ash or potash and uh, the charcoal, the really black stuff in um, a fireplace. I've done videos on what you can do with your ash and also how to make biochar from the um, charcoal. So I'll link those down in the description, but I'm just collecting a lot of this pot ash here to use around on the garden. It's really high in potassium and other nutrients, but I just do need to collect it before it rains. You want to make sure that you collect it and put it wherever you want in the garden before it rains. So that's what I'm doing here. And I'm just adding a little bit on top of um, where I put all those hydrangea flowers. It's also really great to use in composts, worm farms, if you need to balance acidity. So many different ways you can use potash. Um, and I'll leave that information in the description box. And then I thought I should end the video with a little bit of a garden harvest. This is um, just our little veggie patch that we have and I needed to pick some broccoli for dinner as well as one of the cabbages. The broccoli just it didn't do fantastic, not gonna lie, but it's it's still food. I still didn't have to go to the grocery store to buy broccoli. Um, and we're going to have this for a roast dinner. Really beautiful. And I'm just so thankful that I can have my homegrown fresh produce. I absolutely love broccoli. It's one of my favorites uh, to grow and eat from the garden. And then this little, uh, I think this was a golden acre cabbage. I tried harvesting it, how I've seen people do it. Uh, didn't work so I needed like a knife or something to get this one out um, I ended up just kind of pulling it out but this one thankfully survived it did have a lot of kind of bug pressure but it was nice and firm and I just really wanted to harvest it and pick it and use it for dinner again so so happy that I am able to grow cabbage here I've never grown cabbage before my opa in this garden used to grow massive cabbages and cauliflowers and I'm so excited to bring the soil back to life so I can grow some like that wanted to say a massive thank you for watching this video it really means the world to me that you enjoy watching these and I love sharing the garden with you all 
I hope you're all having a lovely day wherever you are in the world. And until my next video, happy gardening, everyone. Bye. And then I'll deal with them later. I just need to get this job done because I just need to get this job done. I just need to get this job done. And, and for this job, I'm going to be using the um, Fiskars, I don't know what they are. And for this job, I don't understand why dogs need to bark so much.